So yeah, like I said, 4.7 quadratic formula, I want you to write the formula like this. x equals negative b over 2a plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. We'll write this formula three separate times, okay? And then we'll write a piece of that formula for a fourth time. When, when you are not able to use notes, the organized use of color and all those study strategies I taught you last quarter become increasingly important, right? So continue to use, always take math notes in two to like four colors, right? Because I want you to be able to highlight things or write it in a different color so it'll stand out in your brain and you're just more likely to be successful if you do it in that way. Okay, so problem one here, we're just using the quadratic formula. It really doesn't get a whole lot te more tedious than plugging stuff into the quadratic formula. But because you're doing so many calculations along the way, it's really easy to make mistakes. So like I've said eight million times this year, you just gotta be super careful with your negatives and things of that nature. I'll emphasize where I see kids making mistakes in past school years um, in the hopes that I can prevent you from making similar mistakes. When you plug it into quadratic formula, I want you to always, every single time, have it as ax squared plus bx plus c, that standard form for a quadratic. You know it is quadratic because of the square here, right? That's what tells you it's quadratic. That also tells you you're likely to have two solutions, not always, but likely to have two solutions. That's what the square tells you. There'll be two x value solutions. Now with parabolas, you could have zero solutions, two solutions, or one solution. And we'll kind of go through that process as the lesson progresses. So to get it into the x squared plus bx plus c form, what I need to do is subtract the 4 over. So we'll do that first. And then I want you always, every single time, to identify a, b, and c. Because people make mistakes, right? I always have reasons for everything I suggest you do because I'm trying to stop you from making those careless errors. And especially after I just graded your last quiz. Like I'm, I can remember two kids that got an 88% on that quiz. The only mistakes they made were simple little kind of I forgot a negative here, I forgot plus or minus. Those kind of things I've been emphasizing to you guys. And people would make mistakes in that regard. So they lost 12 percentage points in half points off on various problems. So if you can take the like six or so careless errors you make and cut them in half, it's like a letter grade higher. Like it makes a huge difference. So we're constantly trying to reduce the number of careless errors you make. So identifying A, B, and C and writing it down so you can see it is one way to eliminate careless errors. And I always get a few obstinate, stubborn students who won't identify A, B, and C. And invariably, they'll make some little mistake. Like they'll plug in negative 1 for B in one part of the equation and then plug in positive 1 for B in the other part. Don't do that. So yet again, we will write quadratic formula in the way I want you to. So many times with this quadratic formula, students will want to take this denominator and divide it into the numerator. Can anyone tell me why you can't do that? No, why can, like if I have 14 up here and 7 down here, why can't I just say it's square root of 2? Right? Because only the numerator has the radical, the square root sign, the denominator does not, so you can't mix the two. If I had square roots in numerator and denominator, then I could mix the two. You'll never have that in quadratic formula, so never divide from the denominator into the numerator. So I'm just going to write don't divide.
And then the other little helpful hint I would give you guys is we want to simplify p squared minus 4ac before we do anything else, right? So we'll make sure to simplify p squared minus 4ac first. I'll just say that. So we're going to plug this sucker in. Realize I'm plugging in the B first. There's a negative in the formula, and there's a negative in front of the B. Two negatives make a positive, right? So we have negative, negative one. I'm going to show that step just for people's understanding, but I normally would not show this step. So in that numerator with the negative B, the negative is there, and the B is negative as well. That's why it becomes a positive. And then we have 2 from the formula, and our A value is 2. So I will force you to plug this in using parentheses. Meaning, if you don't use parentheses on one of these kind of problems, then I will take points off, even if you get the right answer. Okay? I just got so sick over the years of kids not using parentheses, and they get the wrong answer anyway, so just use parentheses every single time you plug a number in. And again, to stop you from making all those careless errors. Right, just showing that before you do any steps, the only thing I did was plug in for A, B, and C with what I just wrote down. If you're thinking about getting partial credit on a quiz or a test, just this simple fact will get you a couple of points. I haven't even done any math yet. You're just showing me you can plug something incorrectly into a formula. That's good, right? I will reward you with a point or two out of four on that problem. And then the simplification of the rest is where you get the additional points. So we'll start that simplification process. So negative, negative one, positive one, two times two is four, plus or minus. And then I recommend you guys plug this entire thing underneath the radical into the graphing calculator. So if you need a graphing calculator, bust it out. If you need to borrow one, I got one up here. Anyone else need a calculator? I got more than one. Okay. So, I'm going to put in the entire underneath the radical part. That underneath the radical part is called the discriminant. We'll learn that later on in the lesson, but I just want to introduce that topic right now. So, going to the graphing calculator, clear all this stuff out. We have negative 1 squared minus 4 times 2 times negative 4. Right, so before I hit enter, I always go back and I double check to make sure I entered it correctly. So, do that. Looks good. And we get 33. So that's what's underneath the radical. Okay, so square root of 33 over 4. Now I want you to realize, if I can simplify this radical, please simplify the radical. In your homework, there's a square root you can simplify. A lot of students in previous classes were looking at the solutions going, how the heck did they come up with this? Well, that's why I taught you how to re, you know, simplify those radicals before. We did it with the complex numbers as well as before that with just positive square roots. So this, right now, we're done. This is called an exact answer. It's exact because the square root of 33 is uh, like a decimal that you would have to round, and as soon as you round, you have an approximate answer. So a lot of times in textbooks or SAT, they'll say things like exact answer. That's what they need. Don't simplify the square root unless it works out evenly.
So that's the exact answer. We're also going to show you how to get the approximate answer by plugging this into the graphing calculator. We'll plug in the plus one first and then the minus one next. So we do one fourth. The way you do a four, or the way you put a fraction in is just divide. And then we'll do plus square root. You go second x squared to get the square root. We had 33 under the radical. Now wait, before you do anything else, on this calculator specifically, you'll notice how the blinking cursor has kind of extended that bar on top of the radical out. So to do it properly, you have to click the right arrow. I always have to click twice for whatever reason. And then I'm outside of that radical, okay? And then I can divide the four, okay? And if you have an old school calculator, the way it'll look when you do this, like I'm just talking about the square root of 33, they'll give you like that beginning parenthesis, that's a single parenthesis, parenthesis. Um, you, you'll do that, and then you would have to close that parenthesis as well. So if you get that beginning parenthesis, then just make sure you close it before you do the divide by four portion of the program, correct? So we get 1.69 as one of our approximate answers. Just going to erase this thing. So x equals 1.69, round it to hundredths. Again, if you struggle with rounding, please tell me. One of the easiest things I got from one of my favorite students is five and above, give it a show, right? You may have learned that technique in middle school. So we go to, it starts at tenths after the decimal place, hundreds, next one, thousandths. So we look at the number in the thousandths place. That's a six, it's above five. So that six makes the eight turn into a nine. Okay, that's what the five and above, give it a show means. So hit second, enter. Then it'll bring up what you just put into the calculator, and then we can go back and change that plus to a minus, like that, and then hit enter, and we'll get negative 1.19, right? Because that six forces the eight to go one up. So negative 1.19 is our second answer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Probably. I think your phone's making noises. Is that you? Is it him? Did you call? I will check. Yeah, check. Some of these phones making noises. Okay, cool. You want me to turn the noise off? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so what does this mean? This tells you where that parabola crosses the x axis. Okay? So that parabola hits the x-axis at 1.69 and negative 1.19. So we've learned a whole variety of ways to tell where the parabola crosses the x-axis. We factored, right? We set those factors equal to zero. You end up with two parentheses, set each parenthesis equal to zero. That was in 4.5 on your quiz, right? Where you had like a quadratic that equals zero. You know to do that. We also learned in the graphing calculator how to get a zero. Um, we also learned to complete the square to get a zero as well, to force something to factor that does not factor. This is another method to get x values when it will not factor. Okay? Sometimes it's just easier to do quadratic formula. It's tedious, but it works. So I want you to try this one on your own. Again, write that quadratic formula. Remember, you're not going to be able to use the nodes. You get no cheat sheet for formulas or anything like that. Just write it over and over and over again because that's one good way to memorize formulas. Just write it, write it, write it. You already know it. Like, how many people think they already know that formula? Raise your hands at home as well. So that's like about half of the students already know the formula. If you're in that boat, you're lucky. You just can easily remember formulas. If you're not in that boat, 
Listen to all these strategies I give you to be able to remember the formula, okay? And you too will be able to remember it. So go through, try this out. I'll start writing the problem down in a couple of minutes. Um, and then we'll kind of go from there. Let me tell you, underneath the radical, you should get zero. Okay? So that just will help you kind of along the way. Yes. Hopefully you have fun in the snow, got outside and played around, it was good. I shoveled for roughly four hours on Sunday when it was just dumping like crazy. It was a good workout, but I'm on the social committee at Good Old Mohai, and one of the tasks we were given is to write 15 thank you cards to teachers. Um, and I was trying to write these thank you cards over the weekend, and my forearms kept cramping from all the shoveling. Did you get your career together? Yeah, good. Yeah, excellent. That's good. Very light. Nice. That's awesome. Good idea, right? Massive snowstorm. Get a crew of uh, people together and shovel some driveways. You can charge money and make a bunch of cash. Easy way to make money, kind of during take advantage of the snowstorm, right? Good stuff. You should get negative three. X equals negative three is your answer. So if you didn't, look at your, the work you did and try to figure out why, and I'll start to plug it in as well, so you should be able to see. So we get negative 6 over 2 times 1, which is 2. So negative 6 divided by 2, negative 3. 6 squared is 36. And then if I multiply negative 4 times 1 times 9, I end up underneath the radical with 36 minus 36. 2 times 1 is 2. Again, you guys will be tempted to divide that 2 up underneath the radical, never do that. That does not work. Violating math rules. So, just to show, like I wouldn't show this many steps normally, but if I was taking one of my own quizzes or tests, I would show as many steps as I can. Right, so that whole fraction cancels, which means the plus or minus doesn't matter either. So, x equals just negative 3. So again, what does that mean? Let's look at the graphing calculator. And just good to be able to tie all this stuff together. You don't have to plug this in in the graphing calculator, but I just want to show you what it looks like. So hit zoom 6 to make sure we're in a standard window. So remember, A was positive, which makes the parabola a U shape. And this is called a bounce, okay? So it'll come down from the top here and bounce at negative 3 and go straight back up. If we had a negative A term, then it looks like a mountain, right? So they can also come up from the bottom, bounce off the x-axis, and come back down. So don't freak out if that happens. It's technically, we have two negative threes is the answer here. And I'll just show you what that means if we look at this same problem from a factoring perspective, right? Because if you look at that, the C term is positive, the B term is also positive. So what multiplies to 9 and adds to 6? 3 and 3, right? So let's, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, so I'm just going to copy this to a new page and just show you a factor real quick. So 
You can always use the cross part of the Indian method even if we don't have a leading coefficient, even if there's no number in front of the x squared. Up top, remember it's always a sum c, the bottom is b. I emphasize this, review it, because what do you take in three weeks if you're a junior? SAT, right? Three weeks, it's right around the corner. So, like, if you're forgetting stuff, like, turn the brain on and try to remember as much as you can. Understand colleges know COVID happened. So, some colleges don't even watch your SAT scores, but some do. And you don't know which one's going to want it and which one won't. There are several thousand colleges in the country. Some will want it, some won't. I think the majority won't look at it too much, but you might want to go to that college that wants to see your SAT score and will hold you accountable for that score. So just, I encourage you to take it seriously because you'll want to. So A times C is 1, C is 9, 1 times 9 is 9. The B term is 6. You can do it, Danny. You got it, So what multiplies to 9? and adds to 6, 3, and 3. So, this is like a 4.5 problem where we factor it, and then we would set each parenthesis equal to 0. Well, if they're the same, I won't do both of them, I'll just do 1. We would subtract 3 from both sides, so x would equal negative 3. Right, but we technically have two negative 3's as the answer, so that's where that comes from. Okay? That's why it bounces at negative 3, because we have two negative 3's for answer. Okay? Alright, take a second and read this. Don't write the whole thing down. If you want to write anything down, you could write profit is 200 and the equation in the middle there. But definitely take a moment and read it. Try to figure out what they're asking you for. Think about how many answers you might have. Read it for the important information. So it says your school's jazz band is selling CDs. As a fundraiser, the total profit P depends on the amount X that your band charges for each CD. The equation P equals negative X squared plus 48X minus 300 models the profit of the fundraiser. So in business, they actually use negative 80 times of parabolas to figure out what maximum profit they can make based on how many of whatever they're producing they produce, right? Could be masks, could be Nike tennis shoes, could be anything, sweaters. But they need to know how many of them to make. They're anticipating how much of this product you're going to buy. And you teenagers drive a lot of those markets, right? You're a powerful consumer base because you're not really spending your money at this phase of your life. Many of you aren't. You're spending your parents' money. Right? Saying, you know, I need some new leggings, I need a new golf club, I need a new hoodie, or whatever the case may be. Um, so we want to know what is the least amount in dollars you can charge for a CD to make a profit of 200. Where, where do I plug the 200 into? For the what? Come on. For the what? For the P, right? So 200 equals negative x squared plus 48x minus 300. So I want you to take the notes right now, like you're going to have a quiz at the end of class. Right? So focus, right? That's why I do these little lesson check quizzes, because I will give you quizzes at the end of the class. I won't always tell you when you're going to have those quizzes. I would just expect them. I won't give them to you every day, but expect them every day. Because initially, at the beginning of this quarter, I'll tell you when they're going to happen. 
but eventually it'll just completely stop telling you and just anticipate that you're going to have one, right? So it doesn't freak you out. So doing this, it'd be super easy to subtract that 200 over, but I have two negatives on the right side. So I'm going to add the entire right side over or subtract, as the case may be, over to the left side so I can deal with less negatives. I'm going to add 300 as part of that. Right? You always do it to both sides of the equal sign. I'm going to line it up, right? Because I have a number on the left side, so line up number with number. X with X, X squared with X squared. I'm going to subtract the 48X. And then I'm going to add the X squared. Again, you don't have to do this. I can't force you to do that. I'm just trying to reduce the possibility of you making a careless mistake. So, on the left side, we're left with x squared minus 48x plus 300 equal, or 500, that's what I meant to say. So again, we should get two answers. If they're giving you a story problem like this, you assume you're at least going to get one answer, most likely two. When you get random numbers like this, I would anticipate having those two answers. Again, identify A, B, and C. So A is 1, B, negative 48, C is 500. And then, guess what I'm going to write again? The old quadratic formula, right? You should write it again as well. So x equals negative b over 2a plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. So remember how I was writing the negative negative? I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm just going to do that part of my head because it's not that hard to do. So I'm just going to write x equals, it's negative negative 48, so positive 48 over 2 times 1. So we get 24 there, right? But I would show those steps because then I can give you the partial credit. Then we have the square root of negative 48 squared minus 4. The a value is 1. c value is 500 all over 2 <coughs> times 1. Again, I'm going to throw what's underneath the radical into the graphing calculator. You should play along. Always, before I hit enter, I double check. Question? Thank you. I missed the old square. So it's a good little lesson here because I don't want to have to type that all in again. That's going to annoy me. So I'm at the negative. If I go second insert, I can just hit the squared and then I don't have to rewrite the whole thing. So that second delete, you'll notice it says insert right above and it'll insert it in front of the cursor. Okay. And then I hit enter and I get 304. So if you don't get 304, throw your hand up and I'll help you. Okay, so 304. So dividing this first fraction, I get x equals 24 plus or minus 
square root of 304 over 2. Right, and again, never divide up into that radical. And then we'll throw this in the graphing calculator. So we can say 24 plus second square root. I don't know why that was said that. Second square root. So second x squared is how you get the square root. x squared is right here, kind of in the middle left. And then throw in the 304. Again, we're underneath the radical still, so I have to hit the right arrow to get out from underneath the radical, and then I can divide the two. So remember, we're looking, let's just use our common sense here. Many times when you guys take tests, your common sense flies out the window. You all have that common sense, please use it, right? So it says, what is the least amount? If I'm just thinking about this problem and what the answer might be, and I'm looking down here, if I do the plus one, am I going to get the least amount? Duh, of course not. Right, so I want the minus one. The only reason the minus one wouldn't work is if we get a negative number. That can happen for sure, but I just did the positive one and I got a positive number, so now we're just going to double check to see and make sure that the negative one works. So you can plug in that thing again by hitting second, enter, and then I'll go back to the plus and change it to a minus. Like that. And remember you guys, the difference between the minus and the negative. The negative is a lot smaller and raised up slightly whereas the minus is longer and exactly in the middle. Because your calculator will not like you if you use the negative instead here. So then you just hit enter. So you got 32.72 for one x value and 15.28 for the other. So x equals 32.72 and 15.28. Both of these were talking dollar signs. If you know you're the type of kid that forgets units frequently, do the dollar signs in a different color or highlight it. Do what you got to do so you remember. Okay? And then the dub question is what's the least amount? Clearly 15.28. So you're going to charge $15.28 for a CD. Now, CD is back in like the 90s, but you know. Okay. Discriminant. We talked about it at the beginning of the lesson. All it is is what's underneath the radical. So B squared minus 4AC, 4AC is the discriminant. So. Just that part, not the square root, just the b squared minus 4ac. Okay? And on the next slide, I'll show you like the different possibilities of discriminant values. We'll talk about what happens if it's positive, what happens if it's zero, and what happens if it's negative. So we got these graphs. I would write down like the b squared minus 4ac greater than zero. Or you could write down b squared minus 4ac is because greater than zero. It's a positive number. Just seeing the word positive with the little number sign, right? That just makes it easier to understand. So if it's a positive number, you have two real solutions. Graphically, what that means is it's going to cross the x-axis two times. Right? If, a is, if you have a positive A, you have a minimum, and the graph is right side up like that. Whereas if you have a negative A value, you have a maximum. It looks like a mountain, mountain max. And your graph, like I just said, looks like a mountain. So write down those three columns 
It will just help kind of crystallize the information for you. And even right here, b squared minus 4ac is 0. Write the word 0 because you're more likely to remember it if you write that word. So if it's 0, you get one solution. And it's going to bounce just like that x squared plus 6x plus 9 one did. Right? So it'll come up from the top, bounce off the x-axis, or come from the bottom, bounce off the bottom of the x-axis. So that means that we're going to have two of the parentheses that are exactly the same, like we did with x squared plus 6x plus 9. So that's what your answer will look like. And the discriminant will be 0, right? So that whole second fraction just cancels. So if b squared minus 4ac is a negative number, then you have no solution. Right? In 4.8, the last section we covered before our extended weekend, we dealt with uh, negative square roots, right? Imaginary numbers. So if it's imaginary, what happens is the parabola never touches the x-axis. Right? It can also be a negative A that never touches the x-axis. See, we're almost done with the lesson already. We just have one little discriminant problem to do, and then let's see. I'll give you a sec to write all that down. I'll put the top one up there in case you missed that. <coughs> and do the virtual hand raise once you're done. Was that reading your mind there? Thank you for the virtual hand raise. So, those of you that are at home, are any of you going to stay home after spring break? Okay, we got one. Anybody else? Two, three, four? Okay, just curious. Because this class is huge, I only have 32 seats in here, I have 35 students. So with the four of you staying home, we'll have enough seats. Otherwise, I would have people sitting up at my desk there, which gets pretty tight. We still got a couple people writing. Don't forget the virtual hand raise if you're done. I just got a new little Rebus camera today, so that thing works again. It's just irritating me. Yeah. I mean, today, is that snack machine still going? Like the one down by the gyms? Does that thing, or they, they take it out? Yeah, sorry. You, you know what you can do is go to the health room and get a snack? Yeah, go. Well, let's, we, we got one last problem. It'll take like two minutes. Okay, anybody need more time? Okay, take your virtual hand raise down, please. And write this one down. So the last problem, just using the discriminant. Shockingly, I'll write the discriminant again. I will also identify A, B, and C. If I give you a quiz that's not multiple choice, I would force you to identify A, B, and C, like A with a little blank space, B with a little blank space, etc. So here, A is negative 2, B is negative 3, C is positive 5. <coughs> so we're squaring that negative 3, so negative 3 in parentheses squared, minus 4, times negative 2 times 5. So we get 9 when we do negative 3 times negative 3. Negative 4 times negative 2 is 8. 8 times 5 is 40. So 9 plus 40. Again, if you need to, plug that into your calculator. And I would or take my own class every single time, plug it into the calculator, think what it is in my head, plug it into the calculator to confirm. We end up with 49, which is clearly a positive number, which means we have two solutions to this problem. So if it says use the discriminant as it does here, 
Don't do the whole quadratic formula, right? All you need to do is the b squared minus 418 part of it. And then you know that we have two solutions. Okay, so that's all you have to write. If it were multiple choice, the multiple choice choices would be zero solution, one solution, or no solution, one solution, or two solutions. Any questions? Yes? So if we look back here, right? Positive number, two solutions. If you get zero under the radical, just one solution. Negative number, no real solutions. And as I would like to say, the problem has no soul. Okay? So that's all I got.